the role of libraries is becoming more central in some sense, more appealing um, because they stand out from the rest of society. Libraries are kind of refuges. They're quiet. They're places where you can think, you can meditate. Libraries are perhaps the most democratic institution you can imagine because we're non-judgmental. We open our doors to anyone to come in and, and avail themselves of the resources. Libraries are the first place where anyone in the community can go with questions to seek information. Is there anything better than walking into a library for the first time, the wonder and joy of experiencing all this knowledge in one place, this history, this entertainment at one's fingertips? Looking at the birth of the American public library movement of the late 19th and 20th centuries, you had libraries, but they were private libraries that were really only available to the wealthier, the elite. In fact, the great mass of the population was excluded from this world of knowledge. Now, though, we can, thanks to digitization, open up the treasures of these research libraries and make them available to the whole world. Most people in the country and the world simply don't have access to this content, but increasingly they are gaining access to devices that can act as portals to this content. We can be talking about tablets, we can be talking about an individual using their, their laptop or their handheld device, or wanting a book. It's still about access to information, it's still about uh, promoting literacy and, and reading. One of the founding ideas behind the DPLA is to connect the disparate efforts of libraries, archives, and museums across the country into one effort. And we do this in the DPLA through what we call hubs. We like to call it the, the on-ramp to the Digital Public Library of America. We'll help you get your collections digitized and uh, made accessible up into the Digital Public Library of America. Libraries also are places in communities where there's been an intentional effort to collect the historic records of that community. We've seen everything from what you would expect, bound material, books. Photographs and manuscripts, diaries. Postcards, music scores. High school yearbooks have been very popular. Broadsides, family letters. Glass plate negatives, nautical charts, maps, fabric sample books. You know, the easiest way to describe what DPLA is is to think of it as a virtual library of Americana that's free and accessible to all. We like to say there's no such thing as a small, insignificant library online. Your collection is just as valuable as anything that's held by the Boston Public Library or Harvard or the Smithsonian. The way the DPLA has been designed and will operate removes the need for the digitization to happen at the local level. Each hub can digitize, they can store content, they can aggregate data, they have metadata geek squads that they send out to help people. We will literally get in a car, take a look at what you have, come out, come up with a plan to get it digitized and make sure that it winds up in the best possible place for DPLA to, to then harvest it. Uh, the first example is here in San Francisco where we're literally uh, taking it to the streets, to our neighborhoods, scanning neighborhood archives. There's an amazing history, maps dating back to the 1800s, biographies about community members. I think one of the most interesting things was, was Helen Keller's bathing suit. And we almost didn't digitize this. We were out at the, uh, the Fisk Public Library and they, they mentioned, oh, it's too bad we were never able to do the bathing suit. And we were like, what bathing suit? And they, you know, they open up the closet and there's a big box with a bath bathing suit in it. And they never did it simply because it was just too big. So just put it in our car, drove it here, we had Helen Keller's bathing suit. Ultimately, our goal is to connect together efforts in all 50 states and share this content more broadly. Creating a digital library is more than just putting digital stuff in, in another place. It's much more dynamic, much more organic, instead of being passive collections just sitting there. Metadata, or the descriptions of these objects in libraries and museums, provides incredible context. And when we serve this metadata to others, we can create and enable new kinds of applications, really new and beautiful and compelling uses. There's the, all this cultural heritage metadata out there coming from all of these different places. It's made accessible via this platform. An API, it's a, it's a way of opening up 
and simplifying a software system so that uh, other software systems can access it from the outside. One thing I could say for not particularly technical users, what's exciting about the Diplay API is if you have a web browser, uh, you have all the tools you need to get started playing with the Diplay API. So people can take and they can play with all of that and actually pull and sort and do all kinds of stuff with the content that's there. Most of the people I talk to think about the DPLA portal as just being another search and browse portal. But in fact, with these new APIs, we're going to see a whole range of tools that will be able to take things that come from different sources and are in different media and put them together, remix them, and come up with powerful new experiences for our users. The API is a way for others to make maximal use of these collections. You could create an interactive map, an app that uses the GPS locator on your device, or to create a web service that provides educational context for others. There's only a sort of a small sort of priesthood making these things. But once you open it, once you get the data out there, once you create APIs to make it easy to get at this stuff, then some kid in a garage can start making uh, a UI to this thing. The people want to, uh, they want to do stuff, they want to make stuff, they're ready. The DPLA is really intended for a very broad audience. There are people all over the country who are now writing the histories of their families or of their hometowns, experimenting with a kind of novel, reporting on work in their businesses or laboratories. They have a lot to say. In order to say it effectively, they need access to collections that we have developed in our libraries. You don't have to go to Washington, D.C. to the Library of Congress. You can be a scholar in your own living room accessing these resources from around the country that are unparalleled. It's kind of like a common platform that brings together the collections of these different institutions so that uh, users who might not even have been aware that these collections existed uh, can find it. The DPLA is the most awesome collection of people and institutions in the country, the Smithsonian, the National Archives, the great research libraries, the great public libraries, regional uh, libraries, small libraries that you've never heard of. What better place than the DPLA to make that accessible? All of the different types of formats that represent history, represent culture, it's, it's more than a slice of Americana, it's a loaf of Americana. We are going to work together to build a tremendous collection for decades to come. I think it's one of the most exciting developments, not just in libraries or in the information ecosystem. I think it's one of the most exciting developments this country has seen. What we're doing is opening the world that once had been closed. It's going to be wonderful.